Good afternoon. Uh, where's Gilbert? Because I was going to start with uh, English, not my first uh, language, uh, but um, well, that ship has sailed. And uh, Jorge, I was also, yo también iba a empezar con un anuncio en español, pero, you know, that's not original anymore. So uh, thanks for the Canada chapter for inviting me over. Um, I'd like to pick up from where Ryan started this morning on responsible consumption. And um, consumption has two sides. It has what you do with the resources and how you allocate them, and the other side is how you get them. Um, but I'd like to approach the way we you know, gather resources uh, through our jobs or whichever means we use uh, from a different approach. Um, oh, he also mentioned that uh, Monsanto is about 22,000 employees worldwide, right? I used to be one of those 22,000. And uh, um, to be honest with you, I, I didn't know the name of the company when I started working there. Uh, not even for a few months, because it actually goes under another name in Colombia. And um, I do want to say that most of those 22,000 people there, they're, they're not bad people. Uh, some of them are great friends, and just like me back then, we didn't know what, you know, w the company stood for, or the products, or, you know, some of the policies it does. So, I like to approach um, what we can do uh, by the manner we uh, get our resources. So, um, the title of my presentation is um, The Workplace as Vehicle for Socioeconomic Transformation. Boy, if there ever was an awful title, it's this one. Um, but what comes to mind when you hear words like workplace? You think of jobs, uh, companies, business, economics. Whenever we talk about jobs, uh, we tend to approach the subject strictly from a business or economic perspective. And this is a very narrow perspective. The nature of jobs and companies understood as individual work and organized collaboration stems directly from our individual and collective evolutionary needs for self-preservation. Early human societies would extract nourishment uh, from its environment in order to propagate the species, as well as, as other resources, uh, for protection against certain elements in its environment, such as weather conditions and predators, especially in Canada, weather conditions. That's been a, a tough one for me. Um, well, each individual within the group would gravitate or be assigned a role or series of responsibilities. A harmonic relationship would emerge among the individuals, just as a group as a whole would usually develop a balanced and symbiotic relationship with its environment. Thus, uh, the social roles, or jobs as we call them in the current paradigm, and the coordination between those roles can be perceived as the transactional relationship uh, with its ecosystem. Uh, this, this leads us to a broader approach in uh, understanding the relationship between work and the environment. Uh, that's the science of ecology. Economics is nothing but an extension of ecology, or at least in my perspective, um, with the limitation that it approaches production and distribution, excluding the intricate relationship it has with the quality of the interactions with the environment and the quality of interactions between human individuals and groups. That is why economics can contemplate environmental and social costs, save when they are monetized as fines, bribes, or promotional campaigns. Um, so now, that we've bridged ecology and economics, uh, I would like to cross over a concept um, from ecology into economics, which can give us uh, a new perspective of, on how we can transform the global landscape from within the workplace, and that is the trophic cascade. Um, the Encyclopedia Britannica uh, describes the trophic cascade as, and I quote, an ecological phenomenon triggered by the addition or removal of top predators and involving reciprocal changes in the relative populations of predators and prey through a food chain, which often result in dramatic change in ecosystem structure and nutrient uh, cycling. Um, the word trophic uh, means of or relating to uh, nourish, nutrition, uh, from the Greek trephine, to nourish. Um, thus, trophic cascade refers to chain reactions occurring across the trophic levels or steps of a, in a food chain of an ecosystem. Now, what is most remarkable of this phenomenon is the profound and large-scale impact that one small, apparently innocuous change can have in altering an ecosystem. In the last 20 years, this phenomenon has attracted much attention uh, from ecologists around the world, and one particular example has been the focus of attention. Um, I would like to share with you this extract from writer and environmental activist George Monbiot on Trophic Cascade. Um, the classic example is what happened in Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. 
The wolves had been absent for 70 years, so the population of deer had built up, for there was no predator to hunt them. Uh, they reduced the vegetation in some areas to almost nothing through excess grazing. However, as soon as the wolves were reintroduced, although few in numbers, they were able to immediately create a significant effect. By hunting the deer, they altered its grazing behaviors. The deer started avoiding specific areas in the park, such as valleys and gorges, where they could be hunted more easily. Immediately, these places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in six years. Bear land became forests. Um, when that happened, the birds started to return. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers thrive on trees. Uh, beavers are what they call ecosystem engineers, for they create niches for other species. The dams they built on the rivers provided habitat for otters and muskrats and darts and fish and reptiles and amphibians. Uh, the wolves also killed coyotes, and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, and then more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carcass the wolves had left. Uh, bears fed on them too, and their population began to rise, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs, and the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. But here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began the rivers to meander less. There were less erosion, channels, channels narrowed, more pools formed, more rifle sections, all of which, all of which were great for wildlife, wildlife habitat. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks, so they collapsed less often. Uh, so the rivers became, became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the, and the vegetation recovering on the valley sites, there was less soil erosion because the vegetation stab stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in numbers, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. A small pack of wolves changed the physical geography. So how does this translate to you, to us, to the workplace? Well, as we mentioned earlier, companies and organizations are just like any other ecosystems in evolutionary terms in which each one of us is interconnected directly or indirectly, and they are susceptible to the trophic cascade phenomenon. Of course, trophic literally means, uh, refers to nourishment and food chain, and we don't want to take it too literally in this scenario. Um, no, we want to understand the dynamics of specific tangible and intangible elements that behave in organizational networks similarly to nourishment along the trophic levels of the food chain. Elements such that are fluid, transactional, and can cause incrementally cascading effects. Um, so which could these elements be? Well, the most obvious is money in the form of personal income, but it's absolutely irrelevant for the purpose of constructively transforming the, la the landscape, for it promotes personal greed more than anything. However, the capacity to allocate money is extremely powerful for shaping the direction and impact an organization can have. To be in a position where you can have some level of influence on how the organization allocates its resources can have a significant cascading effect far beyond the company walls. Another intangible element rather underestimated in this age of money is information, technical knowledge, as well as critical judgment. To possess knowledge the company requires or to wield um, your colleagues' respects towards your judgment can also make powerful waves across the organization. Many of your colleagues would want your input before taking important decisions because they value your judgment. Another element is the amount of processes or activities you can influence directly. For example, the customer service VP can write all the customer service policies he or she likes, but the actual person face-to-face -face with a customer or across the telephone can literally make or break the company's sales. So the more activities an individual affects directly, the more influence he or she can have on the outcome and how it reverberates within the organization and beyond. We tend to believe the CEO wields the most power in an organization, um, but that is far from true. Their ability to exert control lies in their ability to motivate or inspire fear in his or her subordinates. In an ever more dynamic and fluid workplace where the new generation of executives hover from one company to another, the traditional carrot and stick technique does not always work so well. Intimidation is now shifting more towards wooing by CEOs. Um, on the other hand, executives now wield a greater power than before, yet they still don't do any actual real work. 
It's true, which places them in a position of dependence on their subordinates. So who actually wields real power in an organization? There are different groups. Um, the first one, I call them the gatekeepers. Uh, this group of individuals are in positions where their decisions, what they do or not do, have incrementally cascading effects. And what is more surprising is that very often they are not even aware of the kind of leverage they hold within the organization. Uh, first among these are personal assistants. They organize schedules for decision-making individuals, um, sometimes being up to them who their boss meets or what activities are bumped up the list of priorities. Then we have secretaries, sometimes the same role as a personal assistant in small, in small organizations. They screen calls, deciding who the decision-making individual speaks to. If they don't like you, they'll make you hold forever. They book transportation, lodging, food, entertainment. They call a lot of shots. Their bosses don't have the time or information to make themselves. Another gatekeeper is the receptionist. Um, again, very similar, screening powers the above, uh, with the added effect that it, it, sometimes, it, it, it sometimes has direct contact with uh, uh, customers and all the stakeholders. What's curious about these gatekeeping roles is that the individuals that hold them often look down on, on them, on, on those roles they have, uh, dismissing them as setbacks or stepping stones on their road to success, as we've been thought to believe, and many times being promoted later to positions where they don't have as much power to influence and shape the landscape. Then there's a group of the technicians. Um, we love them, by the way. Scientists, researchers, engineers, designers, architects, artists. These are the ones that create new ideas, the ones who test them, and the ones who build them. These are the people who actually create value to society. The cascade effect that technicians can create is perhaps one of the biggest among all the individuals in an organization. Just like the wolves in Yellowstone, who were in direct contact with the tipping point species, the deer, technicians are in direct, are in direct, direct contact with perhaps the element with most significant incrementally cascading effect, and that is efficiency. Efficiency in product design, in aesthetics, in production, in distribution, in recycling, and all processes technicians directly work on. They will not only make organizations more profitable and competitive, but benefits will cascade beyond the organization into society and the natural environment in the form of diminished exploitation of nature and human society. Things like planned obsolescence can be relatively phased out, and things like Product durability, expanded functionality, social and environmental responsibility can be ingrained into individuals' values and collective culture as competitive advantages for these organizations. Um, a growing trend in organizations is the use of freelance individuals. In the current paradigm, organizations use them as a means to reduce payroll expenses um, and labor responsibilities. But what they see as a monetary advantage is actually an opportunity to introduce new values and ideas into an organization through an external individual that is not subject to the organization's perhaps obsolete and castrating culture. Finally, there's the key holders, like I like to call them. It's the first group of um, key holders are the, the ones that let people into the organization or out of it. These are the human resources uh, personnel. They recruit, they select, they train, and they police individuals uh, that make up the group. Um, the difference between a creative, responsible, sustainable, and profitable organization versus an acquisitive, destructive, and term oriented one is the people they hire. Supervisors and, and human resources personnel have that power, not just the human resources VP, but the analyst that screens the CVs and interprets uh, the personality tests. They can put the right people in the right places, exponentially multiplying the cascading effect. Another group of key holders are um, individuals in procurement, or also known as the purchasing department. They look for suppliers, uh, review compliance with specifications and company policy, uh, they request quotes, and determine where to purchase. It is important to highlight that not all, com not all companies buy from the che cheapest suppliers. Uh, many do, but those tend not to survive in the long term. There are environmental and socially responsible organizations sprouting everywhere uh, who offer products and services that comply with buyer specification ever more and more price competitive. Individuals in, proc in procurement departments of the buying organization can channel resources or purchases towards this new type of more responsible organizations. Uh, many green and new technology organizations are struggling because they require resources from mainstream organizations in exchange for monetary resources, but can't replenish them to continue their operations because their transactional volumes of goods and services are not sufficient. Procurement individuals 
secretary's personal assistance. And any individual in an organization with purchasing influence can reverse the, this resource dynamic, monetary and other, creating a cascading phenomenon by making this new type of responsible organizations thrive without endangering their own organization in the long term. So how do you start transforming this ecosystem we call society? How can, how can you transform the, dy the dynamic of these modern trophic elements? How can you transform our current landscape? We have seen how a small band of wolves altered even the physical geography of a vast ecosystem. Can we as humans, armed with awareness and determination, change ours? It's curious how in some cultures the wolf is projected to a personality archetype with a negative connotation. However, in nature, wolves are no more or less valuable than any other species in its ecosystem, such as grass or birds. They're all just as valuable for balancing the natural equilibrium. They all need each other for the survival of the ecosystem and thus their own. Just as so, it is in any organization. So don't underestimate the cascading effect you can have from any position or from any kind of organization, be that a company, a school, an NGO, from public office, of, or as a freelancer, a social worker, or an activist. I want to be very clear with this. I'm not encouraging sabotage, nor am I promoting the current socioeconomic paradigm. We could perhaps consider it as economically productive activism, or in just, uh, just as another form of, um, another front alongside with other forms of activism. Um, I'll conclude by saying this, though. Nothing I've said so far will lead to a complete paradigm shift. It can reduce some problems and buffer other. But what, is, but what is valuable is understanding how the trophic cascade phenomenon translates in modern day organizations. And that is that a small number of individuals, by identifying elements with cascading effects that create chain reactions across an organization, can change the socioeconomic landscape. Furthermore, and I think this is uh, what I really like to highlight, is that these individuals will find themselves in positions with significant influence over production and distribution resources. And history has shown that, it, that in times of crisis or revolutionary change, it is precisely those who have such levels of influence over production and distribution who have a greater say in the new direction the world takes. They may have been operating from the previous set of paradigms, but they were the ones who knew how to keep things running until the new ones set in. I truly hope it's you next time around. Thank you very much.